And that's what you do when it comes to conspiracies. You find all the coincidences and you tie them all up with a nice little bit of conspiracy coloured string. Hello, Michelle. Hello, hello. (laughs) Hi. What's new? Everything's new. I'm new. It's a new day. And it's a new life for me. It's not a new robe. And I'm feeling, no, it's not a new robe. I know we talk about the robe every time. I actually put it on especially for you because it is just another piece of clothing. And now I know that you love it. It's my recording robe, my (laughs) R&R. It's like you're eating pants. You've got your recording robe as well. Have you got eating pants? No, I don't have them. (laughs) I should have an eating shirt though because... I tend to make a bit of a mess of myself by breakfast. What's going on? I don't know. It's like I've missed my mouth or something. I don't know what's (laughs) happening. I can't wear white shirts anymore. That's for sure. But that's like the time you miss the gusset. Sometimes I miss. Sometimes I miss. It's just the way it is. Now, Michelle, I have a quick query from a listener from a couple of weeks ago. Okay. What is it? Lay it on me. And also from last week as well. You remember we were talking about Sonny and Cher with the Rock and Roller Cult episode? Yes. And then for some reason we brought up Cher again last week because you were talking very passionately about the genes that you can turn on and off and you could literally turn back time. Turn back time. Yes. Now, remind me, what's her name again, the singer of that song? Cher. See, this is the problem. (laughs) I say Cher. You say Cher. I do say sure. Now, the listener wants to know, why the fuck does Michelle say sure? (laughs) That was the actual question. (laughs) Sunny and sure. Now, I'm going to tell her I think it's because that's what Australians say. Now, I've got a friend who uh, actually is a friend of my brother's and uh, she's related to a really good friend of mine whose name is Sher, spelt C-H-E-R, and she's known as Sher. And I'm wondering if it's because in Australia, like Maroon... The colour maroon is now maroon. Yes. It just gets mispronounced by one or two people. And before you know it, the whole country is saying it that way, like broccoli. I don't think it's quite like broccoli. I think it's more like pasta because Australians do say pasta. Yeah. We say data. You know, we say sure. We say maroon. But the lady's name is Cher. I'm Cher, bitch. Oh, do you know what? I'm going to have to hear her introducing herself. Cause- Cher. But you know what? It's so automatic for me just to say sure. It's sunny and sure. I don't know. It just is. Anyway, can you please reveal who the fuck said, why the fuck is Michelle saying that? <laughs> it's our beautiful Tubble, ex-Tubble listener, Yannicka. She was quite confused. Okay. She didn't say fuck, actually. She was just really confused as to why. She's like, why is she saying it like that? She couldn't get it. Because all Australians say sure. Sunny and sure. Except this Aussie here. On yeah, but this now side. you say pasta as well. You know, you've become very Britishized. I've lived in England for since I was a teenager. Mm. Also, because I think I've always said share. Or apologies. I don't know. Maybe you only heard of sure when you were in the UK. Maybe sure was not part of your what? life. No, I grew up with share. Okay. I grew up watching the Sunny and Cher show. Uh, it just sounds ridiculous that her name is Cher. It's like you share a bar of chocolate. That's her name. Although I don't. I just eat it all. But that's her name. <laughs> just because you don't like it, you can't change it. <laughs> I had a friend called Lara. Well, in America, they call her Lara. Uh-huh. Lara, can you get me a, a glass of water? And she's like, it's, it's Lara. <laughs> and certainly I can get you a glass of water. Like, like, it's just, you know, it's t- potato, potato. Fair enough. But I'm, th- I'm sure Cher might have an issue. I don't know. Do you think she'd mind if you're calling her Cher? <laughs> so back to the occult, rock and roll and the occult episode. I had mentioned to you, we got a comment on the YouTubes. Did we? From a guy who was talking about the Ace Freely part of the oh. <laughs> episode where he got punched in the face by a ghost. He said it wasn't that Ace got punched in the face by a ghost. It was because Paul Stanley punched him in the face. And you know what? I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think it was – I don't think there was a lot of love left at the end of that. What happened? Ride, rock and roll ride. You're going to have to watch the Kiss documentary. Is there one? 
Yes, there is. Oh, my God. Are they unmasked? They're absolutely unmasked. And honestly, you kind of wish they put that mask back on. (laughs) Because Gene Simmons, he's really the the main one. It looks like someone set his hair on fire. (laughs) It's like. It's like singed <laughs> and wild. Singed. It's crazy. And <laughs> and he says, I look pretty good, don't I? Like he oh. thinks he is shit no, on a he, stick. Guess what? That guy shit on a stick. He dated Cher. Oh. He did. Oh they were an item back in the 80s. No. Oh yes, they were. God. Seismic convergence here. It's all coming together. What can it I does say? come together. And I've got something to um, talk about about that later. I'm going to hold off because I know that this week's episode, which is about hijackings, spoiler. Well, hijackings are interesting because I don't think about hijackings that much, but there are all sorts of jackings. We talked about house jacking in a previous episode. Yeah, that's right. Where somebody just moved into someone's house while they're on holiday and decided that was theirs now. And they sold the fucking house with no legal rights to do so. For me, if I think of hijacking, I think of the most famous hijacking of all time. I think I know what you're going to say. Of course you do. It happened on the 11th September 2001 when four passenger planes were hijacked by Islamist terrorists. And if you haven't clocked yet what I'm talking about... It's 9-11. 9-11. Which, speaking of Americans and the way they pronounce stuff, if you're outside of America... It's 11-9. 9-11 is the 9th of November. But we're just going to run with it and call it 9-11, September 11. And also, I'm just going to add here, because you know today I'm not just going to be talking about a hijacking. I'm going to be talking about... Great. We love it here. But you think about this. 9-11 in America is 911. Yeah. Yeah. The emergency number. Right. When you need to call the police or the fire brigade. Coincidence, Geordie? And that's what you do when it comes to conspiracies. You find all the coincidences and you tie them all up with a nice little bit of conspiracy coloured string. You do. And you put a big bow in it and you call it QAnon. (laughs) I'm going to take you back to September 11, 2001. Remember it well. What were you doing? When when did you hear about it? I had just dropped my then boyfriend off at the airport and I came home to my flatmate who was in the um, UK. In the UK, Nick from Scarfo, watching TV in the next room. Nick said, Come in here. Oh, my God, I can't believe it. Come in here, mm. quick. And we both sat there staring at that TV as it happened. Like, so obviously we missed the first plane, but we saw the second plane crashing. Well, nobody, I think, got the first plane. No, I mean, there were no TV crews at that point. No one, I think, has any footage of that first plane. I remember I was living in Edgecliff with my then boyfriend in Sydney. And he'd gone to bed, but I was up really late really late watching TV because you used to watch TV, actual TV back in the days. Yeah. There was no streaming or on demand or any of that rubbish. Fuck knows why I was watching TV. There were news flash. We interrupt, you know, this broadcast kind of thing. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? And I woke him up because he was working for one of the big TV stations in Australia. And I said, I think you need to go into work right now. This is fucking big news Mm. and he got straight in the cab and went after midnight to the tv station and i don't think any of us realized what was going on there no what basically happened and this is maybe for our (laughs) our younger listeners listeners, who, who maybe don't really like have this context but so september 11 2001 nearly 3,000 people were killed when Planes were flown not only into the World Trade Center in New York, but also the Pentagon and a Pennsylvania farm field. Or did they, Jordy? I don't know. I guess you're going to tell me though, aren't you? I am because there have been conspiracy theories that have been floating around for more than Mm -hmm. 20 years and they just refuse to die and they keep niggling at people. And actually, it did not take long for people to look at the footage of those planes well, that one plane flying into the second Twin Tower in New York. Yeah. And within hours, people were like, hang on, 
something does not add up here. And, you know, conspiracy theorists were already coming up with stuff that people still talk about to this day, literally hours after it happened. So today I'm going to just look at a few of the more kind of persistent (laughs) theories that have been hanging around 22 years after the fact. My head is already filing through all of the ones that I'm aware of. Because we've all heard them. Look, before I actually get to conspiracy theory number one, I'm just going to dig a little deeper into the mechanics of September 11 for people who maybe need a refresher. So 9-11 or what was called the war on terror. Axis of evil. was basically four terrorist attacks against the USA by the Islamic terrorist group Al-Qaeda. Am I saying that right, sure? (laughs) Yes, I think you've got that correct. Al-Qaeda. Or at least this is what America claims, that it was Al-Qaeda. But was it? Back to these terrorist attacks. Do you know what? I think I would think I would say Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda. Yeah. How do you want me to say it, bitch? Just how it, whatever <laughs> you're comfortable <laughs> with. <laughs> you know we're going to have Al Tega on us. <laughs> yep, saying what she's saying now. Al Qaeda. <laughs> Is that how you want me to say it? Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda. Yeah. Al Qaeda. I think that's how it's said. Al Qaeda, like hyena. All right. So. All four terrorist attacks happened on the morning of Tuesday, the 11th of September, like I said, 2001, when Al-Qaeda hijacked four passenger planes. The first was a hijacked American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston to LA, which crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center at around a quarter to eight in the morning. The second hijacked flight was United Airlines Flight 175, also from Boston to LA, which crashed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center at around 9.03. And it was this crash that was all over the news because news channels were covering this first crash and then were like, what the fuck? And, you know, saw the second plane crash into Tower Number 2. Yeah. And you can see, like, the North Tower is burning in the background. And then the third hijacked plane was American Airlines Flight 77, which was a Washington, D.C. flight to L.A., which crashed into the Pentagon at 9.37 a.m. And the fourth hijacked plane was United Airlines Flight 93, flying from Newark in New Jersey, basically New York, to San Francisco, which crashed into an empty field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania at 10.03 Now, it would actually have been a lot earlier, except the takeoff had been delayed by 42 minutes. Apparently, the reason the plane crashed into this random field is because the crew and even some of the passengers on board UA-93 rebelled against the hijackers and tried to take control of the plane because they kind of realized that the ultimate goal was flying that plane into the White House. Right. So that's the bare bones of what went down that morning. On board all of those planes, and I will say that most of those planes were more than half empty, thank God. Okay. There were a total of 246 people across those four planes. It could have been a lot worse in terms yeah. of human casualties. And none of them survived, Jody. Not one single person, including all 19 hijackers across those four planes. So after all this went down, the US went into overdrive. George W. Bush, who was president at the time, created a new government office called Homeland Security. Didn't exist before then. And that was devoted to protecting America from terrorism. They also decided that Al-Qaeda was responsible for all this. So they went hell for leather to catch Osama bin Laden who was the leader of Al-Qaeda. Yeah. And they wanted to bring him to justice for killing all those innocent Americans. So Bin Laden was living in the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan at the time, Mm -hmm. which was ruled by the Taliban. Do you say Taliban? Taliban. 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 I said Taliban. We're never going to get these (laughs) pronunciations. We're representing two different sides of the globe, I suppose. Taliban. Taliban. All right. It's probably Taliban, though. Whatever it is. America insisted that the Taliban hand over bin Laden so he could be punished for his crimes. Except the Taliban basically told America to fuck off. And that if they wanted bin Laden, they had to show proof that he was the dude behind 9-11 and all the attacks. Didn't he admit it? Well, no. And the thing is that George W., old George W. Bush, then 
basically told the Taliban to fuck off. And that's how you do business. Well, yeah, and he was like, do I need shit to prove that bin Laden did it? Uh Uh-uh. They knew what they knew Mm -hmm. and they wanted bin Laden. And when the Taliban refused to hand over bin Laden, America decided to go to war with Afghanistan, which saw the Taliban being removed from power in Afghanistan and a new president was chosen by the people. Now, I'm just going to put it out there, and this is not, you know, my thoughts, yeah. but the general thoughts. It was mooted at the time. It was no coincidence that America yes. deposed a militant fundamentalist Islamic group off the back of what happened. But I will say that in late 2021, just a couple of years ago, yeah. the Taliban took control of Afghanistan again mm-hmm. after the fall of Kabul. But that's a whole other thing. Circling back to the USA, defeating the Taliban, this really ruffled the feathers of old George W, who thought, well, fuck it, let's invade Iraq too and get the Taliban out of there. Who's got the most oil fields? Exactly. And it was fucking sketchy as to whether or not the Taliban was even there. So George W decided to prove that the Taliban was in Iraq by sending his Secretary of State, Colin Powell. I think you'll find it's pronounced colon. Colon Powell. It is colon, isn't it? It is. They pronounce it colon, not colon. Colon. That was a new one on me. That was a new one at the time for Colin. I just can't bring myself to say colon. No, don't say colon. It's Colin. Colin Powell. Yeah. Jesus. This is an English speaking country, believe it or not. You know, and I still can't get these goddamn pronunciations right. Basically, George W sent colon off to show some dodgy evidence to the UN yeah. that supposedly proved that Iraq was making, and here we have it, weapons of mass destruction. Yes, I remember this one. The entire invasion of Iraq hinged on these weapons of mass destruction, which was pretty flimsy. And the UK, Australia, Poland, and Denmark, random, all backed piled in. the US. Yep, they all piled in. So the government of Iraq was overthrown. The people chose a new leader and, surprise, surprise, no weapons of mass destruction were ever found. Again, a ploy by the US to remove despotic leaders and have democratically elected leaders in Islamic states? Possibly. For years, bin Laden, he evaded capture. But then in 2011, under the Obama government, a mission was launched called Operation Neptune Spear, where United States Special Operation Forces raided bin Laden's hideout compound in Pakistan. And on the night of the 2nd of May 2011, Osama bin Laden was basically shot in the head and chest. And conveniently, his body was buried immediately at sea. And so there was no grave. Weird. And no evidence was ever seen as to whether or not that guy was dead or alive. Okay. It's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I've even thought that deeply about all of that. And this isn't even 9-11 stuff. Yeah. That's sort of the background to it all. But, you know, 20 plus years later, people still want to believe that Al-Qaeda was not responsible for 9-11, but that it was the American government basically sacrificing its own people to serve a greater end, which was to crush the Taliban in Afghanistan and invade Iraq in response to these four terrorist attacks. Whatever you believe, I'm going to go through a few theories, starting with a theory that there were traders who were doing insider trading because they knew about the attacks before they happened. What, so pulling money out of various oil companies or? Not quite. The reason they think this is that right before the September 11 attacks, there were some dodgy trades that happened within the stock market and insurance firms, and this raised a red flag. Now, apparently a ridiculous amount of put options were placed on United Airlines and American Airlines stocks. Mm. Now, a put option is, I had to look this up because I didn't know. Uh, It's a contract that gives the buyer the right, but not the obligation to sell an asset at a specific price at a specific date of expiry. It's hard to understand if you're not a financial person. I don't really get it so much. But what's interesting is that the value of a put option increases if the asset's market price depreciates. And obviously, directly after 9-11, the market price on United and American Airlines 
the stocks bottomed out, you know. So they're saying that the traders were tipped off about the attacks and massively profited from the tragedy. Now, the US Securities and Exchange Commission apparently did launch an insider trading investigation into all this. And what they say they found was evidence that Osama bin Laden and other terrorists traded in the options market just three days before 9-11 happened and that they profited from stocks in United and American Airlines going down after the attacks. If that's true, smart move, Osama, because it means that he knew if he was the one blowing up those trade towers, then he was like, fuck it, why don't I make some money off this too? Yeah, I'm going to yeah. put some put options in place. And I'm not saying it's true. I'm not saying I agree that Osama bin Laden did yeah. because we all know that there's a potential for this to not be true. Sure. <laughs> but this is what they're saying. But also the traders who put the put options in place – they must have known something was up if they've got a Taliban leader putting these put options in place for those two airlines. Yeah. So that could also have been leaked. Whether or not you believe that, that is one of the conspiracy theories out there. Now, this next one is one of the main conspiracy theories that are flying around about 9-11. And it's the idea that planes did not make the Twin Towers collapse. What? That there were bombs already inside the towers that were detonated to make it look like a crash. So what they're basically saying is the Twin Towers didn't crumble because they were struck by those hijacked planes. Yeah. They were basically blown up in a controlled demolition. Conspiracy theorists say that the towers were blown down rather than blown up with explosives that were placed in specific locations across the two towers. And this theory has had legs over the years because apparently there have been witnesses and survivors who have come forward and said they heard explosions coming from inside the building as they tried to escape. And on top of this, there have been loads of architects and scientists that have spoken out to say planes fuel payload in no way could produce enough heat to melt the steel frame of the two buildings that collapsed. Good God. And that the damage caused to the buildings, no way in hell could have have been caused by a plane crashing into it. Fuck. And there are loads of videos online Mm. that show things like before that second plane impacts the building, there's a flame coming out of the windows of that second tower before it was hit. And People point to this as clear evidence that the towers had already been smashed with explosives and detonated before the crash. So, again, what's the truth here? No one really knows. It's really worrying. It is really worrying. Apparently, commercial planes are constructed using a really light aluminium. Aluminium? Aluminium. Aluminium. In America. And that a plane that light crashing into a building it just wouldn't have done as much damage as what did happen. And that bombs had to have been used. Leveling two of the tallest buildings in New York City, causing a huge gaping hole. And, of course, there was that massive dust storm that went, as a result, came flying through. Exactly. And there's loads of talk about the way the towers collapsed and how it looks identical to the way controlled bombings happen. Yeah. I'm not an expert on that, so I don't know. There's also a lot of speculation about the Pentagon attack and how scientifically it does not add up. I find the Pentagon crash kind of baffling because conspiracy theorists say that the impact holes in the Pentagon could not have been made by a plane because the holes are so much smaller, the impact holes, than a commercial American Airlines plane. They're smaller than the plane. Basically, if a plane had actually smashed into the Pentagon, the damage and the big impact holes would have been massive. They would have been a lot bigger than the planes. Yeah. But they're not. They're not. Okay. And conspiracy theorists also wonder why, after all the shit that had just gone down in New York, why was the plane that was clearly not on its normal route and was entering airspace that is kind of protected Hmm. why was it not shot down or at least flagged 
prior to impact. Good point. And also people are wondering why of all the parts of the Pentagon that could have been hit, apparently the part that the plane went into was a piece of the Pentagon that was being renovated. Ah. It was completely empty. No people, no one in. I mean, honestly, it's a good thing that there was no one in that part of the Pentagon. Sure. Just something to think about. Yeah. Okay. I'm pinning it. Pin that. Now, I also said that there was a fourth plane that crashed into a field because it didn't make it to the White House. Well, obviously, conspiracy theorists have theories about this too. Yeah. And they think that Flight 93 was staged. There are people out there that believe that after the passengers supposedly staged this intervention and battled with the hijackers, that Flight 93 actually landed safely somewhere else and a substitute plane put into action by the US government was shot out of the sky to again reinforce the evil antics of Osama bin Laden. Now people also say that the passengers on the plane could have been murdered in some way to keep them silent about what really happened and I remember hearing at the time that bodies from that plane were never recovered. What? Not a bone, not a body, nothing. Leaving loved ones with no closure at oh, all about what happened on that flight. I didn't know that, Michelle. Yeah. And honestly, there's absolutely no way that there would be no human remains found. It would be littered. Yeah. I mean, come on, we've both seen yellow jackets. People can yeah. survive this shit. But <laughs> that's TV. I know it is TV. And they ate each other. But look, that's why conspiracy theorists are calling kind of bullshit on flight. 93. And another reason that conspiracy theorists are really skeptical of the whole 9 11 attacks is because apparently the passports of some of the hijackers were found. Huh? They found the passports of some of these Al Qaeda terror supposed wow. Al Qaeda terrorists. Where? Well, this is the thing. Those towers, they're all going up in flames. Yes. The Pentagon crash. This plane crashing into a field, everything up in flames. And yet these paper passports were found when there's not even a single piece of human remains. That's crazy. And all of this came out after a documentary called Loose Change came out a few months after 9-11. Okay. I haven't seen this documentary, but apparently it's a super low budget film made by some college kids. Apparently they actually started out sort of fictionalizing some things like what ifs. Mm -hmm. And then as they investigated, it turned into this full-blown documentary about all the shit that didn't add up about 9-11. And this is what people continuously go back to is this um, Loose Change documentary. They were the ones that raised this point. How in an attack that destroyed buildings left no traces of victims' bodies. Yet you find four little passports. Exactly. Their picture and everything. And, you know, these passports and IDs that were found, were used as evidence against Al-Qaeda to pin the whole thing on them. So it's not surprising that conspiracy theorists questioned how these paper passports survived. you got to wonder. And now, I don't know if you remember this as well from back in the moment, but there was a lot of media attention around mobile phone calls that were supposedly uh-huh. made from people on the hijacked planes yeah. to loved ones on the ground. I remember that. And conspiracy theorists are basically saying bullshit and that loads of the mobile calls made from the planes were faked. The main reason being that scientists have come forward to say there is no way in 2001, even now to be honest, that people could make a phone call. Yeah, they could get reception from the altitudes that the planes were typically flying at. And I agree with that because even now reception on planes even on the runway it's fucking sketchy yeah up in the air just does not make any sense to me so casting mind back to 2001 when mobiles were nowhere near as advanced and there was no 4g 5g none of that so i think it's pretty far-fetched that people could make calls from up in the air and also Apparently, one of the most famous calls that people reference are a call from a son to his mom where he says, hi, it's me. And then he says his first name and his last name. Oh. It's like you saying, hi, mom, it's me, Geordie Gron. 
(laughs) It doesn't make any sense. Is that true? This is apparently what people are saying and it was reported. So, Hmm. and I do think if there are terrorists in a cockpit and the plane's going down, you're not saying that shit. You're not saying that shit. You're just saying, mom. You're saying, I'm scared. I'm going to die. I love you. I'm sorry. I was a bad son or whatever you're saying. You want to make your peace with the world. That's interesting, Michelle, because I didn't think about that. And now you're telling me this, I do have to wonder how accurate the reports are in retrospect. There's been a lot of time, there's 20 years, have a lot of these things been added to or has the narrative been changed to suit these potential theories? We must also explore that. We must, but not today because I've just got but some not nice today. conspiracy God theories. No. <laughs> Let's go nuts. Because you had said earlier that, you know, Osama bin Laden took responsibility, but initially he denied all responsibility and involvement with 9-11. And he was like, not me, not my organization. Mm -hmm. But then there were those tapes that did the media rounds where he supposedly did claim for responsibility for the, the attacks. And it's fucked up because no one really knows which of the tapes are real and which are fake. But America wanted Bin Laden gone, so who knows. But what I want to talk about as a final conspiracy theory here okay, is what people are calling the smoking gun for all 9-11 conspiracy theories. And it's to do with the third tower that went down at the World Trade Center, known as Tower 7, which... Mm-hmm supposedly collapsed seven hours after the Twin Towers. I don't know about this one. You will when I tell you about it, I think. Okay. Um, because unlike the two Twin Towers, Tower 7 was not hit by a plane. Yeah. And conspiracy theorists argue that this third tower was brought down in a controlled demolition. This building is a skyscraper. 47 stories high. I've seen the pictures. It's fucking massive, you know, twinkling with glass and bronze metal. And it came down due to fires inside the building. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is based near Washington, D.C., they say the Twin Towers, the effects of the towers collapsing, caused Tower 7 to collapse. Now, if that's true... That would make Tower 7 the first and only steel skyscraper in the entire world to collapse because of fire. Right. And there's a group of architects, engineers and scientists that have all come forward in the media saying there is absolutely no way that fire caused that building to collapse and that it had to have been a controlled demolition. And there's actually a group called Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And the founder of that group is a guy called Richard Gage. And these are his words. Building 7 is the smoking gun of 9-11. Mm. A sixth grader can look at this building falling at virtually free fall speed, symmetrically and smoothly, and see that it is not a natural process. Mm. Buildings that fall in a natural process fall to the path of least resistance. They don't go straight down through themselves. Right, yeah. And there are a few key facts that have added fuel to this fire of all the conspiracy theories around Tower 7. The first being that even though its collapse is the first ever of its kind in architectural history, all the thousands of tons of steel from the skyscraper were immediately taken away to be melted down. Why? So they couldn't forensically look at it? Well, there was not one single scrap of metal available to be forensically investigated by anyone. They got rid of it all, Geordie. If it's true, it's not looking good. And if, like me, you're probably wondering, why the fuck would the US government want to get rid of Tower 7? Well, one theory is that the Secret Service, the CIA, the Department of Defense, and... The Office of Emergency Management, which is the department that coordinates responses to disasters and terrorist attacks, their offices were inside Tower 7. Right. All of those, CIA, Secret Service, Department of Defense. So why? Because there were key documents inside that were all destroyed. Everything was destroyed. That was their filing cabinet. Yes. Coincidence? Mm. I don't know. But... 
you know, then there's the fact that the destruction of the third tower was apparently never even mentioned in the 9-11 Commission report. Okay. They just completely didn't connect it. So the first official inquiry into Tower 7 by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, yeah. which, remember, had the office in Tower 7. Yes. They were never able to be definitive about what caused that collapse, which is weird because, like I said, it wasn't hit by a plane. It wasn't even that close to the Twin Towers. Other buildings did not go down from it's aftershock yeah, that or is weird. catch yeah. fire, but this one did. The very building that housed a lot of top secret documents from secret U.S. government departments. So what's the upshot of all this? I don't know, Michelle. What is it? You tell me. After doing loads of reading, thanks for that. <laughs> and look, and seeing firsthand, I, I read a lot of firsthand accounts. Yeah, what are your feelings? I do think there's something more going on here. That's my feeling. Do I think the government staged the whole thing to be able to invade Iraq and remove the Taliban from Afghanistan? Maybe. Maybe. It's unlikely, but not out of the question. Okay. And are there things that don't add up about these terrorist attacks? Absolutely. Mm. But do I have any answers? Nah, absolutely not. We know that the US government covers up all kinds of shit yeah. because we know that there are redacted files and things that people can't get yeah. their hands on. But people, if you've got any ideas, get in touch. Do write in. Wow, Michelle, that's incredible. Food for thought. There it is, kids. You got it. Well, I'm going to follow up with my own little hijacking, not little hijacking, no hijacking is little, I'm not trying to be little, this hijacking. And the reason why I came to it, Michelle, was because I was interested after our episode on the rock and roll and the occult, which we mentioned again at the top of this episode, and... Apart from um, what you said, and also the update episode, specifically Dave Navarro. So because you were talking about Jane's addiction from two weeks ago, then last week it was, or the week before last, it was Dave Navarro and his awful story about how his mother had been killed. Mm. So there was two weeks of you talking about Jane's addiction. And I just went on a little bit of a rabbit hole search because I remember I had pointed out to you that Dave Navarro replaced... John Frusciante, who was my favourite guitarist in Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, mm -hmm. he was there for 10 years before John Frusciante came back and then he left again and a guy called Josh Klinghoffer replaced him. And I thought, well, who's that guy? I didn't even know that he'd left and been replaced. But then when I was reading about Jane's addiction, it turns out that Klinghoffer has now replaced Dave Navarro because he's got long COVID and he can't tour right now. So this is what sent me on this direction, right, to find out about this particular <laughs> hijacking because Josh Klinghoffer is quite interesting in that he plays for lots of different bands and he's an amazing guitarist, blah, blah, blah. He's replaced John Frusciante and he's replaced Dave Navarro. And now what I found out about him is that he is related to some people who were involved in something called the Achille Lauro hijacking of 1985. So I'm going to take you back to October 1985. That was in his Wikipedia, you see. So that's what made me go, what's that? And when I looked, <laughs> I found a really fascinating story that I should have heard about at the time because I was old enough to listen to the news then, but I didn't know about it. And I don't know if you have heard about this Achille Lauro. It's an Italian ocean liner. So it's a boat jacking. It's a ship jacking, if you like. I feel like I've heard the name Achille Lauro. Yeah. I don't know anything about it. I'm intrigued. It had about 750 passengers on it. It was a leisure cruise. From Italy, they went from Genoa to Naples, all the ports there, then on to Egypt, the ports of Alexandria, Port Said. Then they went on to Israel, Ashdod, before hitting up Cyprus, the port of Limassol. Then they went to Greece, and then they went to Rhodes, Piraeus, before heading back to Italy via Capri and Genoa. That was the route they took. Thank you. Gorgeous. Amongst the passengers, there was a party of 11 friends from New York and New Jersey, mostly in their 60s and 70s, who were invited by a lady called Marilyn Klinghoffer, relative of Josh. Now, I don't know how they're related. So it's not his grandparents or anything like that. Maybe it's aunts and uncles. I'm not sure. I couldn't find that bit out. But it was Marilyn and her husband, Leon, organized the trip or invited loads of their friends who they used to go on holiday with all the time. Leon was confined to a wheelchair, Michelle, because he had had two strokes. And like oh I said, dear. they're in their 60s, 70s. It was actually Marilyn's 59th 
birthday. Nice. Having a great time on the cruise. Five days in, they arrived at Alexandria in Egypt. Now, at this point, the passengers were having the time of their lives, enjoying ping pong and lazing around the pool (laughs) and at nighttime dinners and lavish dancing parties and midnight buffets and whatnot. But unbeknownst to the passengers and crew, there were four terrorists hidden among them. Oh, man. Without them even realising. This is like real life Cluedo. (laughs) Pretty much. Now, these guys were from the PLO, Palestine Liberation Front. And it's thought that they planned to attack the ship once it reached the city of Ashdod in Israel. But they were scuppered because a waiter saw them cleaning their guns so they were forced to launch their attack a day earlier so four hours after leaving the port of alexandria these four men hijacked the ship and ordered the captain to steer towards syria their demands were the release of 50 prisoners who were being held in israel and if these demands were not met they would start killing hostages and that's where they stood at this point in the journey. Oh, man. I know, quite stressful, right? You think you're on the love boat. You think you're on the love boat, then you find out you're on the terror. The terror boat. (laughs) So they were heavily armed, these four guys, with submachine guns, hand grenades, explosives, and they made their presence known to passengers by firing their weapons and taking over the loudspeaker system to summon them all to the dining room where they were told the situation. One of the American passengers said... We were getting ready for dessert when suddenly we heard gunshots and someone yelled, get down on the floor. We heard moaning and groaning. The bandits had struck men in the kitchen, we were told. Then they started to threaten us and show their power. They had hand grenades in their hands and they would remove the pins and play with them. They constantly had their guns ready for shooting. We were all on the floor. Jesus Christ. Pretty terrifying, right? These terrorists separated the Americans and the British passengers from the others and placed gas canisters next to those guys. One of the gunmen fired more shots up on the bridge and commandeered Captain De Rosa, forcing him to sail towards the Syrian port of Tartus, while another gunman kept De Rosa under constant guard with a submachine gun. So they've taken over it's like a diehard film here michelle it is but where's that guy in the dirty vest (laughs) he's nowhere to be seen it's a bruce willis who's diehard bruce willis yes that's it if their demands were not met the hijackers of the achille laro had warned the passengers and the crew that they would blow up the ship if their demands to release the 50 plf prisoners from israel were not met ultimately it was a 52 hour ordeal None of the crew or passengers, unlike what you just told me about with that fourth and final possible plane that came down in the field, yeah. strangely, none of the crew or passengers on the Achille Lauro felt brave enough to attempt to overwhelm the terrorists in this situation, even though there were only four, because these guys were armed to the teeth and they were all over the place. They were like really wild, kind of behaving quite erratically. And... It was unknown to the passengers and crew exactly how many terrorists there actually were. They were behaving as if there were far more than just the four. Right. And it's a big ship, so I guess you can't really spot them or know where they all are at once. And also, too, you think about the demographic. These are probably wealthy, elderly people who, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe have some health concerns. They're just there to eat and drink and be merry on a cruise. So there's no young guns. The crew would be probably young. True. By Tuesday afternoon, the gunmen were waiting to be permitted to dock in the Syrian port of Tartus and they made radio contact to attempt to reach the Italian and American ambassadors of Damascus, hoping that they could negotiate the release of their 50 prisoners in Israel. A Lebanese radio station was monitoring this whole exchange and they were able to report back to the rest of the world what was going on and what was being said. And they heard these following events unfold. So at 12.32pm, the terrorists announced... There is no time to lose. The first ultimatum is set for 4 p.m. and has been brought forward to 1 p.m. And then two minutes before that 1 p.m. deadline, they radioed, we are not willing to wait any longer and the first passenger will be killed at 1 p.m. We will communicate the name and nationality of the passenger. By 1.26 p.m., this message went out. What is new at TARDIS? We will immediately kill the second, which indicates they've already killed one. There is no shortage of passengers to kill. 
We threw the first body into the water after shooting him in the head. His wife is wailing about it. That's what these guys said. But were they bluffing at this point? No one knew. Syria had refused to allow the Achille Lauro to enter its waters. Same with Cyprus. No country wanted to get involved in this debacle. Oh, God, that's so mean. If you remember the time, though... 1984, 1985, tensions between the PLO, the PLF and Israel were high. It yeah. was rough times. Yasser Arafat was running the PLO and I think the PLF was like a, a bit of a faction away from right. the um, actually recognized PLO run by yeah. Yasser Arafat, who was trying to make peace deals and things, amongst yeah. other things. I mean, I don't think he was always peaceful. I don't know. I can't remember the details. So no governments wanted to get involved. This ship is floating about with these terrorists on board. Later on that evening of Tuesday, the ship did leave the Syrian coastline and the leader of the hijackers who called himself Omar sent out a message saying, we will hit any ship, any plane that tries to approach us. So they're warning people off. Oh, man. 6 a.m. on Wednesday morning, the Achille Lauro arrived off the port Said, which was back in Egypt. So now the Egyptian foreign ministry is involved in the crisis. Yasser Arafat and his PLO have condemned the hijacking and they sent in their secretary general called Abul Abbas. Now, once Abul Mm -hmm. Abbas contacted the hijackers, things changed. He told them if they surrendered, the Egyptians would guarantee them safe passage out of the country. All sorted. Abbas said, leave the ship. So they did. In the early evening of Wednesday, these four men jumped on a tugboat that took them to the Suez Canal Authority, arriving in Sicily about 30 hours later. Then, on Thursday, October 10, the hijackers boarded a plane from Egypt Air along with Abul Abbas and several other Egyptians bound for Tunisia. But the U.S. Navy had already intercepted the airliner with their fighter jets and stopped them from flying out of Italy. And they were forced to land at a NATO base in Sicily where American and Italian troops surrounded the plane and the terrorists were then taken into Italian custody. So going back to what actually happened on the ship, it transpired that the terrorists had separated wheelchair-bound Leon Klinghoffer from his wife. And once the hijacking was finally over, Marilyn's looking everywhere for him, Her friends and her were looking all over the ship trying to find Leon. No one knew what happened to Leon. They couldn't find him. Shit. I don't think this ends well for Leon. Doesn't feel good, does it? One passenger had observed a terrorist's trousers and shoes were covered in blood. And that, combined with the sound of gunshots and a splash, kind of made them think the worst at this point. It was revealed later that the hijackers had pushed poor Leon Killinghofer in his wheelchair, dragged him to the side of the ship, and I'm really sorry about this, but then they cold-bloodedly shot him in the forehead. And Michelle, I've seen pictures of this guy. He looks like my granddad. It's so sad. But it, it's so mean that they picked the guy I in the know. wheelchair. You know, it's really shit. It's really sad. They then dumped his body in the sea along with the oh. wheelchair. Oh, my God. Honestly. That is so upsetting. I did not expect... Leon to be thrown over. I mean, hopefully they did actually kill him before throwing him over because if he had to drown, that's awful. That's even worse. Don't go My there. God. Shortly after the murder, the gunman told Captain De Rosa what had happened. So the mm. captain knew what he'd done and ordered mm. him to advise the Syrian authorities in Tartus that this had taken place. He also said that the second victim would be a passenger called Mildred Hodes, but luckily that didn't end up happening at all, so Mildred's life was saved. There had been speculation the gunman had murdered an Austrian woman called Anna Horenja because no one could locate her after it was over. Turns out though, Michelle, that poor old Anna was discovered later because she'd been pushed down a flight of stairs at the beginning of the hijack by a hijacker and managed to make her way to an unlocked cabin where she hid for two days, huddled (gasps) under a bed or locked in the toilet. Oh, my God. But lucky. What a survival instinct, you know. Marilyn Klinghoffer sadly had a very long and heartbreaking journey home from the US because she had to stop off in Italy on the way to assist identification of the hijackers in a lineup. But later, she apparently told President Reagan that she spat in the terrorists' faces during the identification parade. Oh, my God. And Reagan said, you did? God bless you. Wow. (laughs) Okay. She's a feisty lady, but, you know, she's just suffered. But can you imagine? You're there for a birthday holiday of a lifetime. And it ends so sadly. 
and terrifyingly. But listen, Awful. and what's even worse is in New York, their daughters, Lisa and Ilsa, were eagerly awaiting news of their parents. And it came on Wednesday when they heard from the State Department that the ship and its hostages had been released with no one harmed. So they celebrated. They were cracking open the champagne. <gasps> no. And then they had another phone call a few hours later saying oh, no. that they got it wrong and now they weren't sure if Leon was oh, alive or dead. God. Yeah. So eventually, on July 10th in 1986, an Italian court convicted three of the terrorists and they were sent to prison for up to 30 years. Three others, including Abul Abbas, were convicted in absentia for masterminding the hijacking. What? So they're saying it was actually, he was behind it. And he was sentenced to life in prison, but I don't know if he actually went to prison. I don't know. Yeah. It was apparently a selfish political act designed to weaken the leadership of Yasser Arafat. That's what they've said. The fourth hijacker was a minor. He was tried and convicted separately to the other three. Okay, but he was tried even though he was underage. And convicted, yes. But I will also say, sadly, Marilyn Klinghoffer already had cancer at the time and she died the following year. Probably of a broken heart as well, you know. It was pretty sad. Oh, God, that's terrible. That's not the end, though, what? Michelle. Because in 1991, well, not the end to the Klinghoffer's... Heartbreak. Sadness and heartbreak. Because in 1991, New York Metropolitan Opera premiered an opera called The Death of Klinghoffer by John Adams, which sparked protests, including from the mayor at the time, Rudolf Giuliani, with protesters reportedly shouting during the performance that his murder should never be forgotten. And Ilsa and Lisa Klinghoffer, the daughters, were initially excited about this opera until they saw it on opening night and hated it. They said it basically reduced their parents to a stereotype of rich American Jews. And they said, it really wasn't about our family. They took an event that happened in history for their own agenda to show their own political views. And they chose what happened to my father. They didn't really care who he was or anything really about him. Oh, that's awful. And that's the end of the Achille Lauro hijacking. So sad. And all that came from me just... Passing time on Wikipedia. But one other thing I found out about Josh Klinghoffer was that he was also in Iggy Pop's backing band, which is called The Losers, along with Duff McKagan, who's from, uh, what's that one? Oh, sweet child of mine. Guns Guns and and Roses. Roses. And Red Hot Chili Peppers drummer Chad Smith is in it. But now Klinghoffer has been replaced by another guitarist who links all the way back from Dave Navarro to that day in Reading when I told you we were visiting our friend. Yes. Backstage. Yes. Jamie Hintz. Jamie Hintz of the Kills. Replaced Klinghoffer in the recent touring version of The Losers with Iggy Pop. It's seven degrees of Dave Navarro, isn't it? Exactly. Holy shit. And it leads back to us. Yeah. I mean, obviously they all need to be eavesdroppers. Geordie, what a story. That's amazing. I know. But really heartbreaking because... That poor that family. family. Like, I cannot get the image of choosing the weakest link on the boat as the victim. Mm. I mean, you shouldn't choose anyone, you know, but what a horrible story. Thank you so much for sharing that, even without the trigger warnings. <laughs> yeah, whoops. Sorry about that. I got most of my information from history.com, by the way. And I forgot to tell you at the beginning of this episode, Niche, just to lighten the mood a little bit, because this is what you need after such heavy fare. Yeah. I found a new TV show and I can't stop watching it. It's so funny. I'm laughing all the way through. It's called Jury Duty on Prime. Thank you for telling me this because I finished Maths Australia. Uh, Have you? It's not finished yet. It's done. You know, I I had some time on my hands when I was sick and couldn't talk. I'm desperate for a new show. So I'm definitely going to watch. Is it fiction or is it like a real life? Well, it's shot in the style of a real life documentary. Okay. uh, Where a documentary film crew are going into the American judiciary system and following a jury. And one of the members of the jury is famous actor James Marsden. Is that his name? He was in Sonic the Hedgehog, amongst other things. He was in Westworld. It's very handsome, actually. What's really going on is they're all bloody actors, except for one person who is a member of the public who has no idea that everybody else is an actor. I mean, he must be getting sus because of the ridiculous things. It's like an episode <laughs> of Parks and Recreations. Oh, Seriously. my God, I love the sound of this already. It's very good. Jury duty. It's very funny. I need good Rex because I'm at a loose end. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. And brilliant story. My pleasure. Well, 
I feel all hijacked out. I have to say that was hijacked out totally. It was some heavy shit that went down today. Bombings, yeah, hijackings, absolutely. boat jackings, all the jackings. Wow. There's only one left thing left to say then in that case, Michelle, after all those jackings. It is wherever you are. Whatever you do. Just, just keep, keep eavesdropping. 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 Eaves